The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. If we name our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. Without the filling of the Spirit, you come to church, you're like a bump on a log. You don't get anything. In fact, you're a hindrance. You must know, rebound, and utilize it often. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit challenge us to what we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. 2 Timothy 3, 2. The, the verses we're going to study deal specifically with Christian sins. Last night we studied Judges which dealt with sins overall. It is transdispensational, which means the worst sins listed in Judges are still the worst sins today. But here we have a listing of sins that are related to the church age since it was written by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3.2 states, For mankind will be lovers of self, Lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, wicked. To be a lover of money, it doesn't mean that you can't appreciate money. We all need it. But it is a sin in relationship to money, such as stealing money or being dishonest for monetary gain or putting the priority of making money over that one hour you need for the inculcation of Bible doctrine. For mankind will be lovers of self. That's the first part of it. Self-absorption. Self-absorption self is related to pride that we studied last night. And under self-absorption uh, you can often become a lover of money. But for the Christian, to be under self-absorption, it means that you find yourself to be more important than God's Word, and therefore you won't give it a hearing. If you do give it a hearing, you're out of fellowship, or you do it once a week. And it's of no value to you, because you're a lover of self. Uh, you are a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God, which we'll get to. So let's move on to uh, verse 3. Unloving. Implacable. Unloving means no understanding of grace orientation for the baby believer. No understanding of impersonal love for the adult believer. Unloving. Implacable. Unforgiving. You hold grudges. Malicious gossips. Remember, we went over many of these sins last night from the book of Judges, chapter 6. Malicious gossips without self-discipline. Self-discipline for what? Self-discipline for making Bible doctrine number one priority on a daily basis. Self-discipline for doing as David did, who in Psalm 1-2 said, I meditate on thy word, on thy doctrine, both day and night. So you don't have that self-discipline related to your love for God. Brutal. Malicious gossips are brutal. People who are implacable are brutal. People who are lovers of self are brutal. Haters of the good of intrinsic value. The good of intrinsic value has to do with divine good production that can only occur when you are filled with God the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. 
You must be filled with the Spirit in order to produce good of intrinsic value. And if you're filled with the Spirit, no matter what you're doing, you are producing good of intrinsic value. If you're a baby believer, under the filling of the Spirit, you are constantly uh, utilizing the faith rest drill. Except you're using the basic part, which is claiming the promises of God for the little mosquito bites that you will receive in your testing to move you forward. And then you move under grace and doctrinal orientation. Once you begin to understand grace, you understand how wrong it is that you can do anything for God, but God does everything for you. And you understand the same about others, and you become gracious toward others. And notice that grace become, comes before doctrine. It says in uh, 1 Peter, or 2 Peter, Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace comes first, knowledge comes second. Why? If knowledge comes first, you become a legalist. You're shoving it down everyone's throat. I don't care if it's correct doctrine. It's not your business. It's my business to do it from an impersonal standpoint, meaning I stand up here and teach. You don't have to listen. You don't have to be filled with the Spirit. All of that's your choice. So grace and doctrinal orientation is what they move into during the baby stages of the spiritual life. And of course, they are using rebound constantly, consistently, whenever they need to, in terms of when they know that they have sinned. And when you're filled with the Spirit, you're producing good of intrinsic value. Now, unloving means that you have no normal or natural love. It actually can end up in sociopathic, behavior that's related to criminality. No natural love. Women drowning their children in bathtubs. That's not, that's not natural love. That's not natural at all. It's not normal. And it's not normal for believer or unbeliever. No natural love. But this is talking specifically about believers. Or believers who abandon their children. That's not natural love. Blows my mind, really. And those type people sicken me. They take on no responsibility. They are self-absorbed. They are a hindrance to this client nation, to God. Unloving means you have no normal or natural love. Now in verse 4, it says they are treacherous, thoughtless, conceited, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And the rather than is very important because there's nothing wrong with pleasure. But if pleasure comes before Bible doctrine, there's something wrong with it. And we're talking about, of course, normal pleasures, such as going to a theme park, going to a lake, going boating, going fishing, whatever you enjoy, playing blackjack, whatever. It's just normal function in life that you enjoy. You enjoy doing something. Playing on Facebook, nothing wrong with it. But when it comes to be a distraction for your spiritual life, then there's a problem. And this is what is keeping most people distracted, not only in the ch churches that teach, the few churches that teach Bible doctrine, but even in the uh, definitely in other churches where people go just to nod to God and they think they're going to be blessed by sitting in a pew. And therefore, I came across an article today. It's called The Great iPhone Distraction. It's written by Vince Horiuchi of the Salt Lake Tribune. Tyler Wustenhoom might be loath to admit but sometimes he's not paying attention in church. He will happily confess that he's not the only one. The 31-year-old Mormon has more than once sat in the pew of his sandy ward and let his mind wander. When that happens, he pulls out his iPhone and sometimes plays his puzzle game 1 to 50. 
Or maybe he texts his friends across the aisle. iPhone distraction. And this comes out of the news that uh, I read some of the religious news as well. Distraction. Your mind wanders. Now I know this is a Mormon church. They're not getting much out of that. A lot of nonsense. A lot of craziness. That's why Mitt Romney didn't win the elections because he was Mormon. I'm convinced of it. People think it's weird, and it is. It's not weirder than a socialist who we have in power now, but all the same, if he were a Southern Baptist, he might have won. That's neither here nor there. Jesus Christ controls history. And the principle is distraction. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. It happens in doctrinal churches. I went to a Bible conference. The guy sitting next to me was drawing Mickey Mouse faces. And I thought of him as gross. He wasn't paying attention. Mickey Mouse was more important to him than the Word of God. He had probably was invited there and had no idea why he was there. But these people are distracted. When you are distracted from the Word of God during that solemn time in which it's being taught to you in which you should be converting Gnosis into Epinosis by the function of Operation Z, which is simply God the Holy Spirit converting the doctrine you know into power, actual power, and that is epinosis beyond knowledge. Last night, I gave you the example of a lake with a dam. And every believer is, as it were, a lake with a dam. And most believers never let the water flow through the turbines, and so they become a stagnant lake and they produce no power whatsoever. Because they can't turn that turbine on their own. They try, but they're lunatics. So what must they do? They must rely on a higher power. And you're either going to function under the higher power of God's plan, which is the divine dinosphere, which is utilizing the two power options, which are the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, plus Bible doctrine. And once the believer is utilizing the filling of God the Holy Spirit plus the conversion of Gnosis doctrine, which is academic knowledge from the Greek, and Epinosis knowledge, which is beyond knowledge from the Greek, then they have the power on and the lights are on in their soul. And again, it's only a matter of flipping a switch. I saw Larry the Cable Guy went to a dam and they showed him the operator of the dam who had no sense of humor. And uh, he said, uh, Larry, go ahead and turn on the dam. Now Larry had not been trained in anything of engineering or anything related to uh, what you have to do with the dam. But all they had were some switches there. He clicked them on and there went the dam. It did its job. Well, all you do is flick one switch, rebound, and then the water starts flowing through, and then you take in Bible doctrine as the turbines begin to turn, and that produces power, a power that can save this nation. The Hoover Dam can light up Las Vegas. You can light up America. Under this power, this spiritual power, a supernatural power, above and beyond what you think you can create in the energy of the flesh, and far too many believers are walking around in the energy of the flesh trying to impress God, and He's not impressed. He's not even impressed if you learn Bible doctrine. But it's for your benefit to do so. And you will be rewarded for doing so on the basis of the production of the good of intrinsic value. Far too many believers don't even know what that means. So as a result, 
all of the things that they did on earth that they thought were good deeds, all of the things that they did when which they thought they were impressing God while they were in carnality under the energy of the flesh, it's all going to be burned at the evaluation throne. And it's going to be the biggest bonfire ever in all of history. And they'll be able to watch all of that wasted work go up in flames. But for those believers, and it actually says they barely escaped the flame. In other words, they just got into heaven by the skin of their teeth. They believed in Christ. Then they are left with a naked resurrection body and shame, the greatest oxymoron of history, shame in a resurrection body. Why? Because they lived out their days as a believer in carnality and thus will eventuate in functioning under 2 Timothy 3, 2 through, through 7. So you see the great distraction. That means lover of pleasure rather than lover of God. Verse 5, holding to a form of, in your Bible it probably says godliness. That is a stupid translation. And they probably even put God in lowercase. God is not an adjective. Godliness. And if you were to ask believers what is godliness, they'll give you a list of morality. You think that's God? God doesn't need morality. But it no, doesn't even say godliness. It's the Greek word eusebiah. And Eusebiah is referencing the unique spiritual life. So they hold on to a form of the unique spiritual life, although they have repudiated its power. Avoid such as these. And I don't really have to avoid such as them. They avoid me. Why you want to hang around somebody Who's, not, who's a believer, who is not utilizing, who is a stagnant, stinking lake with dead fish floating in the water, who are so stupid, they don't know how to turn their dam on so they can have some power in their life and clean out that water. Why would you want to be around such? They've repudiated the power that God has given to them. That means they've rejected it. They are negative toward the word. They would rather work off of their own energy of the flesh power, which is nothing. In fact, it's destructive to this client nation to God. Holding on to a form of the spiritual life, what is that? They run around telling everyone they're spiritual because of their abstinence from certain things. Or because they've given up, that's what absence means, they've given up certain things. Or they have, uh, or they get up at three in the morning and they read their Bible. And they do so without having the gift of pastor teacher and without being filled with God the Holy Spirit. I'm not against people reading their Bible, but it's going to be useless for them. They're going to get confused. Now, I can read the Bible. I have the gift of pastor teacher. I have to. But I also know the corrected translations of most parts of the Bible. So it's very easy for me to read the Bible and understand what it's saying because I've studied it under a pastor who's greater than me. And he studied it under a great pastor also. And that great pastor studied it under a great pastor as well. But there's this form of the spiritual life. Another form of it would be emotionalism, the Pentecostal movement, the fastest growing movement around the world and in the United States. A bunch of emotional garbage. But people want to be entertained. And they say that this emotional high that they get is spirituality. No, it's not. That's your drug addiction, except it's worse. A drug addict knows he's doing wrong. 
Very few say, unless they're justifying themselves, I'm not doing anything wrong. Some do that. But most drug addicts know they've got a problem, or at least they eventually find out they do. The same with an alcoholic. But the one thing about an alcoholic or a drug addict, I've never heard one claim is, well, this is how I feel spiritual. This is how I get my spiritual life together. Well, they get all emotional and get high, and it is, it's emotional high. It works on the endorphins in their brain and the dopamine, much in the same way drugs do. And sometimes they go so flipping out of their heads, they act worse than a drug addict, dancing around, screaming, going around in circles, flopping on the floor, screaming to the top of their lungs. They've lost their minds. Slobbering at the mouth even, they've gone so mad. And the unbelieving world looks at that and chuckles. Sometimes they look at it just for a laugh. I can't look at it. I get sick. It's, obno it's obnoxious. That is not power. You've repudiated the power of the unique spiritual life. And you've gone in for a form of power related to the body. And you're worse than a cokehead or a crackhead because you assign to that spiritual credence while a crackhead does not. You're evil! So we have holding to a form of the spiritual life although they have repudiated its power. They've repudiated the filling of God the Holy Spirit. They've repudiated Bible doctrine. Avoid such as these. Why? Because the cosmic system has a strong pull, undercurrent. You know when you go to the beach and uh, the wind is blowing a certain way, usually crosswind to the uh, ocean, it causes an undercurrent in places. So they'll put out red flag day. Be wary of the currents. Or sometimes they'll say, don't even get in the water or you'll be sucked in. Well, this is what the Bible is saying. Don't even get close. You'll get sucked in. Because you can't change evil, but evil can change you. So holding to a form of godliness, which means holding to a form of the spiritual life, means that oftentimes they can talk a good fight. And they are full of piousness. Oftentimes they're full of amens and hallelujahs and they use a certain language. Praise God. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And they'll use it in their normal conversation and it sounds goofy. And they know it sounds goofy because I've yet to hear a Pentecostal in a grocery store going, There's the eggs I need, amen! And the first day I hear that, I'm going to laugh because I've never heard it. They've lost that emotional kick already. So they got to go back either the next Saturday or Sunday to get their kick again, to get their fix. And they call getting their fix the spiritual life. They're destroying the United States of America and they are traitors. And there are doctors who have doctorate degrees who go to such churches. You'd think they had to have enough academic sense to know this is silly. But for some reason, theology should not have its own vocabulary is the way people think. I should be able to go to church and listen to a few soothing words and get something out of it. No. The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts both ways, piercing even to the dividing asunder, the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. You go to church to get criticized, not by me. I'm just here teaching you the Word of God, but the Word of God I know will step all over your toes. It stepped all over mine before. I've had to look at verses that I did not like. But I had to be humble enough to accept it and make those changes where necessary. But I didn't like hearing the things it had to say about me. 
in my areas of weakness, and neither do you like it. I understand. I've been there. Sometimes I'm still there. I'll probably always be there from time to time discovering something in the Bible that hurts me. But you've got to be humble enough to look in the mirror and say, yep, that's me. Yep, I'll rebound that. Yep, I'll avoid that from now on. I may slip up in the future, but I'll avoid that from now on. That's what I'll say to myself. I don't make promises. You never make promises. To God, that is, because you might be lying to him. might be a promise you can't keep. And it's not about putting a burden on yourself. It's about living the unique spiritual life. The power of the unique spiritual life is referencing, of course, the divine dinosphere. That is the divine power sphere. Such people have repudiated that power because they are in reversionism. What's reversionism? Well, if you go back to essentials, uh, I've studied, we've gone over that study. There are eight points of reversionism, and you fall under reversionism and the cosmic system which is in two categories. Verse 6, For among them are those who creep into households and captivate silly women, weighed down with sins, led on by various lusts. And these, this is not a, you hear, the first thing, because of our pilgrim syndrome, when we hear lust, we think of sexual lust. There are all types of lusts. A lot of times they captivate these silly women not by sexual lust at all, but by approbation lust. Oh, in this church, they will say, we will be friendly. We'll be nice to you. We'll pat you on the back. If you've got a problem, we have our counselors. Are you single or married? I'm single. Oh, we have a wonderful singles group. How old are you? I'm in my 30s. Oh, we have a wonderful 30 single group you can go to for social life. You might even find a good Christian man to date. And, and so on and so forth. And none of that's related to the spiritual life. You say, but isn't that Christian fellowship? No. Christian fellowship is with God. Fellowship with man is secondary could even be tertiary in your life it doesn't matter as long as it's second to God but Christian fellowship is fellowship with God well, you think you need people in your life I know a lot of characters in the Bible who went long periods without people in their life one man was named Elijah he had to sit out through a famine by a river. He had no social life. No what you would call believer intercourse back then. David was out with the sheep. He had rare contact with people. Moses went out in the desert for 40 years. Before, he went out in the desert again for 40 years. And during that time, he had very little spiritual, I mean, very little uh, conversation with people, although that is where he met his second wife eventually. You see, Moses ran from Egypt. Why did I say 240 years? Moses ran from Egypt after he murdered one of the guards of the slaves, the Jewish slaves. As a result, he ran out into the desert. That's where the burning bush talked to him, who was actually a manifestation of Jesus Christ. And for 40 years, he stayed in his own training in the desert. Then he met this family out there, and he married one of the daughters of the family. And then after 40 years, it was time for him to go back. And he went back, and he grabbed up the children of Israel after many exciting things occurred. And he went right back out into the desert, except this time he had two million grumbling people with him. 
the Apostle Paul had to go on a sabbatical in which he was alone in the desert. That was right after his salvation, so he could absorb as much Bible doctrine as possible, and much of the, is the unique spiritual life as possible, and he was alone. There are times in your life when you need to be alone. And Christian fellowship is fellowship with God. Then there are times in your life when God will bring people into your life for a reason. But that's secondary to your spiritual life. Your Christian service, whatever you do in evangelism, whatever you do in administrative work in the church, whatever you do for Sunday school for the children in a church, not grown-ups, Grown-up Sunday school is vicious and wrong and not approved by the Bible. There's one pastor teacher for each church. Poimen didaskalos, pastor, teacher. Not pastors and teachers. One pastor, teacher for a church. Verse 6. So they creep into households and captivate silly women, weighed down with sins led on by various lusts. And as I told you, it could be approbation lust, trying to get them into church because they say they will receive the approval of a lot of nice people. Or they may capture them with power lust. We will put you in Sunday school and they start thinking, well, I'm going to be the best Sunday school teacher to the children ever and they get into competition, and there's no room for competition in the spiritual life. And there's definitely no room for competition either when it comes to Christian service. That's stupid. It's ridiculous. We're all on the same team. But they're captivated by silly things that don't matter. Silly things that will not matter in eternity. They have failed to live their life in the light of eternity. They're too self-absorbed to know how. They're all wondering about today and what can stimulate them somehow. They may never take a drug. They may never take a sip of alcohol. But they certainly do like the stimulation of approbation lust, which is sin. In fact, a worse sin because oftentimes they assign it to spirituality, which is blasphemous. And that's why we will see when we get back to Acts... And when we get back to Acts chapter 5, the first, the first two sin unto death occurrences that occur in the church for everyone to see occurs because of the approbation lust of Ananias and Sapphira. They wanted approval lust from the church. And approbation lust is called lying to God the Holy Spirit. We have grieving the Spirit. That's when you first step, step out of fellowship in the cosmic one. You stay there long enough, you're going to start to hate doctrine and go toward permanent negative volition and there go for go into cosmic two, which is quench the Holy Spirit. You stay there long enough, you'll get into approbation lust, call it spirituality, and that's called lying to God the Holy Spirit. So each stage is worse. Lying to God the Holy Spirit is worse, and it was done so through approbation lust. The lust for fame, the lust for people to pat you on the back and tell you how great you are. Verse 7, always learning. Learning what? Gnosis. Always learning. Gnosis, but never able to come to an epinosis, knowledge of doctrine. That means they're always learning something from usually not just one pastor, but various pastors on the radio, the television, whatever they can find, always learning, or maybe learning from a self-help book, or learning from this or that or the other. But it's all academic knowledge. See, what happens is they're not filled with God the Holy Spirit. Their lake is stagnant and dead. But they're still always learning. 
Well, how do they do that? Well, they're always trying to replenish their stagnant lake with fish, and they always end up dead. So they keep learning. They keep doing the same thing over and over again. Throwing fish into the lake, they die. Throw more fish into the lake, they die. It's academic knowledge. It goes nowhere. Now, if they crank up that dam by rebound, becoming filled with God the Holy Spirit, letting the turbines turn by listening to Bible doctrine, letting some water flow through there, clean up that lake. Fish will live. You'll have a vibrant lake. They're going to do some construction, I hear, on the river that flow, the Scioto River, that flows through downtown Columbus. And they say they're going to make it beautiful. Right now it looks stagnant. But they are going to make it start to flow again. Flow over some rocks. There'll be some pool areas. And then it will flow from the pool over some more rocks. And that oxidates the water and cleans it. And it's going to become like uh, any river in the northeast, which is usually very clear. They didn't build it right when they first built it, so they're going to got, try to get it right this time. And they say it's going to make downtown Columbus look far more beautiful. We'll see. And it probably will. It'll make the river prettier anyway. But you've got to have that power. Believers don't understand how to have it. They think that power is from their selves. They even think that their own emotional outburst at church is from the Holy Spirit and is powerful. If that were true, Jesus Christ, who lived the same spiritual life we lived, would have ran around constantly screaming and being emotional, rolling around, and people would have thought of him as a true psychopath. A dinky dow. Is that what they call it in Vietnamese? That's right. So they never get into the life beyond gnosis, which means they never convert gnosis into epinosis doctrine. Therefore, they never have the conversion of doctrine into power or beyond knowledge, and they never come to understand the unique spiritual life. They are a detriment to our society, a detriment to the client nation, for they do not care for God's Word. But it is God's Word that is alive and powerful, not your emotion. So we are still today a client nation barely hanging on by a thread, and I mean barely. We still have freedom. I have the freedom to stand up here and teach for now. Will it change? I don't know. Can it change? Sure. I mean, it's changed for other people who have had people assemble in their homes, which is where the church first assembled, by the way. And they've had the police come and tell them to stop it or they'll be arrested. So the man got arrested because he wasn't going to stop. Under the First Amendment, we have the right of assembly and it doesn't tell us where. And if it's on your own private property, oh man, our forefathers would roll over in their graves. Your property that you bought with your money, your land, they come in and say you can't have Bible class in a home. Why? Well, it's not zoned for that. You mean I'm not zoned for the Constitution? There's a zone that's outside of the Constitution? I did not know that. But apparently there is nowadays. Constitution says I have the freedom to speak. I'm speaking. My Constitution says we have the freedom to assemble. We are assembled. They won't 
won't stop me either. First of all, they have to have a warrant to come in here. Otherwise, leave them outside. Don't ever just let them in. You never know what they're up to. That is the authority. That's what I'm talking about. You want to get pulled over in a car, of course, pull over. I'm not telling you to be disrespectful to the authorities. I'm just telling you, you have some constitutional rights. Or we used to. And if we lose them, we lose them. But as Peter said, because it became a discussion, they said, Peter, should we stop? They're telling us to stop. They're beating us. And it's against the law now. Shouldn't we follow the law? And Peter said, which is more important, man's law or God's law? And it's God's plan for us to get out and give the gospel. God's law is more important. And when we get beaten and when we go to jail, we rejoice because we know we're having an effect. And we know that it will turn into reward as long as you're filled with the Spirit. All of that whipping will turn into reward in heaven. I'm not saying it's going to come to that in this country, but there's far too many stories in different various areas of the country where our Constitution is being violated, where they're going into people's homes and taking their guns. Why? They didn't have a permit. My permit is the Constitution, the Second Amendment. Now, I don't personally own a gun. One day I may want to target practice or go hunting, I don't know, or just for regular protection. But my certificate is the Second Amendment to the Constitution. That's my permit. Don't need a permit to buy a gun. It was made a right. <laughs> Our forefathers had enough sense to make sure the public was armed. Why? Because they knew government always wanted to get too powerful. And they went so far as to even say, if it gets too powerful, you can rise up in arms against the government. That I do not whatsoever agree with. I'm just telling you what our forefathers said. We do not have a right to rise up against our government no matter how evil it becomes. Because if you do, it's only going to be re replaced with something far more evil. Bad authority is better than no authority. So I do not in any way advocate armed rebellion or civil disobedience or activism. But I do advocate you at least asking if someone knocks on the door who's an authority and they want to come in, ask if they have a warrant. You have that right. If they say, no, I don't, but we're coming in anyway, let them in. They're the authority. They're disobeying the Constitution. But oh well, our country's changed. If they say we're coming in anyway, you've got to let them in. then you might want to seek a constitutional lawyer if we have any left. If it gets that bad. And it can. Don't think it can't. But we're a client nation still. Barely. We're stagnant. We're under the third cycle of discipline. I just read that one out of every four adults live with their parents now because they can't find a job. And those are young people. You say, it's harder for old people to find a job. No, it's harder for young people to find a job because they're just now entering the workforce without experience. So from the age of uh, 21 to 31, they did that because that's when uh, usually they, they begin to get out of college. One in four children live at home or have come back home because of the economy. And the article was being very critical of them. 
Well, they're stifling economic growth because if they go out and get a house and stuff, that will encourage economic growth. Well, how can you get a house without a job, nitwit? What are these people thinking? Just because they have a job, everybody can get a job? The media, that is? What happened to their compassion, anyway? Weren't they the ones always wanting to give out welfare? Now all of a sudden it's terrible to live at home. What they want them to do is run to Uncle Sam, not to run to Mom and Dad. Their plan didn't work out. If it had, we'd be far more broke than we are now. And yes, they had a plan. <laughs> The plan is to garner as much votes as possible by giving as much handouts as possible. You see, everybody likes Santa Claus. Why? He gives out presents on Christmas. And that's the government acting like Santa Claus. How can you hate that? But the silly thing about it, well, most people won't hate it, except the people at the top who have to pay for all of this upwards of 60% of their income in New York City goes to mostly social programs. And they're working hard. And sure, their income is high, but whose business is it? I've never been hired by a poor person. And if the rich person is having a hard time accumulating wealth because it's being taxed at 60%, they're not going to hire as many people. So don't tell those students who can't find a job it's their fault. It's the fault of an over-intrusive government trying to use redistribution of wealth, which is an evil. It sucks out the motivation of businesses, of the people who hire. It sucks out capital, which creates wealth. Government doesn't create wealth. It cannot create wealth. It can only take it. And I get so sick and bilious when I hear about big oil. Big oil is a tiny fraction. They make a tiny fraction of what is taken in by the federal government. They're spending as much money, they're spending as much money as the entire Chinese economy produces. Our federal government is spending as much money as the entire Chinese economy of 1.2 billion people produces. It's big government that's the problem. It was never designed to be that way. Never. As I told you last night, it was broken down at the federal level into three branches. Executive, for the commander-in-chief, Legislative, which has two parts, the House of Representatives and the Senate, and sometimes the House of Representatives fights with the Senate, but the House of Representatives has the power of the purse, and he who has the money has the power. The House of Representatives is in Republican hands, but the Republican Party has fallen apart. And then we have the judicial system, and that is cut down into branches and districts, etc., but not only that, see the Senate is made up of two people from each state, no matter how large or small. Rhode Island is a very small state, they get two senators. Hawaii gets two senators. Alaska with its parts, parse population gets two senators. Texas with its large population gets two senators. New York with its large population gets two senators. South Carolina with its sparse population gets two senators. Why? Because also they understood that we had to have a system called federalism. What is federalism? That means the states themselves have governments. And not only do the states themselves have governments, the municipalities and local areas have governments. So the power is split up and spread out for a reason. So no one gets too powerful. Right now, three-fifths of the states could get together because we do have states. We are very unique in this way. Three-fifths of the states could get together and say, federal government, 
we have now ratified a constitutional amendment in which you must balance your budget. It would then uh, go through the process. It would be ratified as an amendment and boom. But three-fifths of the states won't do that because they get a lot of money from the federal government. And the federal government has taken over any type of state's rights. So there's already been this massive power grab that our forefathers would have disdained. There's a massive power grab right now at the executive level which our forefathers would have disdained. Massive power grab at the level of the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Our forefathers would be terribly ashamed. They would say, this is not how we designed it. And then the 50 states, each one of them a sovereign state. That's why you always hear them get up and say, the great state of Texas gives this many electoral votes to so-and-so. And that's another issue. We were not designed to be a democracy. And everybody asked me, or a lot of people have asked me, what's this electoral college business? Why don't we just go by majority vote and f forget about it? Because when our system was set up, it was a representative republic. And, for example, in Ohio, we would elect a, what's called a, we would elect someone to pick a president for us. That, they're called, uh, they're part of the electoral college. And we would elect so many from such districts. And this district would say, I elect, or Ohio would say, I elect this person to choose my president. And they give so many electoral college people based on population. So in Ohio, I believe there's about 19. What used to be 20, but we had a population drop. 19 electors. South Carolina has three electors because of population. Texas has over 30. You can believe me, the Democrats are really wanting to get into Texas. It's not going to work. If Texas ever goes blue, we can forget it. <laughs> we'll never have a Republican in office ever, ever again. And New York has something around 30. California has 50. And due to math and everything else, it usually comes down to Florida and Ohio, and usually Ohio. As goes Ohio, so goes the nation. And that's because we, as a state, are a reflection of the nation because we have our big cities, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati. We have our union cities, Toledo. Then we have the farmland, which is all Republican. So the country has cities and farmland. So we are an exact replica pretty much of the country. And the way Ohio goes usually is exactly how the country goes. And when I watch an election, I watch Ohio. The first election I watched in 2008, I thought I was going to stay up late. No, nope, didn't have to. Ohio went blue and I went to sleep. And I got blue. But I got over it quickly. Because Jesus Christ controls history. Then the second time around, had to wait a little longer. Ohio went blue. That was it. It was over. He won. I went to bed. And with about the same percentage points that he won across the whole country is what he won Ohio with. Anyway, we elect these electors. Now it's a rubber stamp. In the past, it didn't used to be a rubber stamp. The electors, for example, could choose as they wish. And they can still switch if they want to, but it's pretty much a rubber stamp. But, but they did that because it's a very smart thing. Because the electors that are elected, they have the election, they tally it up, and the electors say, okay, I represent this district, I must therefore vote the way this district says. And then in, Jan in uh, I believe, early January, they make it official. Well, let's say between that time of November, the second Tuesday, the first Tuesday in November up until January, let's say during that time, 
the person that the people wanted to elect goes completely psychotic, shows his butt on television, turns out to be a murderer, whatever. Guess what? The Electoral College can change their mind. But now it's a rubber stamp. And I don't even think they'd change their mind in that situation. In fact, I think some of these politicians could get caught up with about anything and they're still going to get elected. But I told you I would give you a little piece of our national heritage along with the fact of our spiritual heritage because client nation is a Bible doctrine. I've, had, I've, had, I've heard that there are some pastors who've come out of Baraka who say there's no more client nations anymore. There was only the client nation of Israel. After that, we just went into the church age because it's the body of Christ all around the world. Well, it's true it's the body of Christ all around the world, but that does not, want, that does not explain why in Acts, which we'll get to, again, after freedom, in Acts it says this is the times of the Gentiles. That means it is the time of Gentile client nations to God. They simply do not know how to interpret or rightly divide the word of truth. So there are client nations, and we are one of them and about to fall apart. So a client nation is a national entity that is under the patronage of God, assigned the full responsibility for the formation, preservation, communication, and fulfillment of the canon of the scripture. Now before Israel became an, a nation, the custodianship of the word of God involved divine revelation apart from scripture. But since Israel has become a nation, that is back in the Old Testament, it is involved in the authorship. See, Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, and many of the Bibles, uh, many of the books in the Old Testament. But since, and so Israel became the custodian of the Torah, the custodian of the Word of God. And it also, the Jews were involved in the authorship of the Bible. The custodianship and also the dissemination of the Word, of the written Word of God. Additional custodianship was assigned to Israel in the formation of the two, uh, of the uh, of the New Testament. You might not know this, but all of the writers of the two of the New Testament were Jews, all except for two of them. All of the writers of the New Testament were Jews, except for two. During the time of the formation of the New Testament, that client nation, Judah at the time, changed from Judea to the Roman Empire in August of 70 AD in which they were overrun by the Romans and they ceased being a client nation. The custodianship of the Word of God went from Israel to, Rome, to the Roman Empire and mainly to the eastern part of the Roman Empire in the province of Asia, which is modern-day Turkey, the coast of Turkey, the east, the west coast of Turkey. In a place called Ephesus is where the main thrust of the pivot came out of. So in Exodus 19, 4 through 6, we have a reference to the client nation concept. And this is what it says. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if hearing, you will obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be my own possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. Then you shall be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation to me. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Yisrael. Also in Deuteronomy 7:6, 7, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 26, 18 through 19, And the Lord has today declared you to be his people, a people for his own treasured possession, as he promised you. Therefore you are to keep all his commandments. During that time, Israel was under the uh, commandments and the rule of the Mosaic law. And that he will set you high above all nations which he made. Has that not happened to the United States? Yes. The client nation is during the time of the Gentiles now. 
We have been set high above all the nations that he has made. And listen to what follows. And that he will set you high above all nations which he made for praise, fame, and honor. And that you shall be a set apart people to the Lord your God as he has spoken. Now we as a client nation have been set apart for praise. People have looked in awe at our military powers as we have wiped out Iraq and took it over with lightning speed. One of the fastest speeds in history outside of the time when Jesus Christ himself would annihilate a country. And we were able to take over Afghanistan, which was something the Soviet Union failed to do. And with lightning speed, I don't care what the media tells you, we did it with lightning speed. Now we hang around there. Why? I don't know. Declare it one, come back home. Or if you're going to stay over there, wipe them out. Do something. But anyway, that's politics, and I'm not getting into that. But we are for praise Do you, and for fame. Do you know that if you go to Germany, you hear American music? If you go to Mexico, you hear American music. I don't care how horrible it is and how horrible we think it is. They hear it, and they like it, and they listen to it. If you go to Japan, they hear American music. They have their own, too, but American music is there. The American film industry, do you know why they're so liberal? Because they have to cater to more people around the world than they do here. And most of the people around the world envy our wealth. And they make more money off their movies in other places around the world than they do right here. Because the whole world loves our entertainment, loves Hollywood. I knew a Chinese girl once. She said, well, my mother just thinks the American people are the most beautiful people on the face of the earth. And I said, that's because all you've seen is Hollywood. They are the most beautiful people on the face of the earth. The rest of us aren't. <laughs> but that's the impression they get is from Hollywood. You go to Germany, you can watch an American film. You go to Italy, you can watch an American film. England, they're just a big copycat. Russia even, even though they have their own music too, they also listen to American music. The same with the Chinese. Their music is completely and totally different than ours, but they listen to ours, and their movies are different from ours, but they watch ours, and they have a huge black market for American products, and they steal a lot of our rights, our uh, our. Uh, rights in terms of our copyrighted material. They steal it and they sell it on the black market. Lots of people do that in China. But that's for fame. We're known around the world. When our president goes to Africa, whether it be President Bush, President Clinton, or President Obama, they receive an adoring crowd. Every time. For praise, fame, and honor, and that you shall, be, you shall be set apart to the Lord your God as he has spoken. And that is where we're starting to fail. Set apart to the Lord our God. Believers are failing to utilize the spiritual life. So there are two categories of client nations to God in human history. There are the five Jewish client nations of the Old Testament. They had a specialized priesthood based on genealogy. And then we have Gentile client nations during the dispensation of the church that has a universal priesthood, 1 Peter 2.5 and 1 Peter 2.9. No Gentile client nation of the Old Testament was a client nation to God. And in the same way, Israel is not a client nation to God today. Only the Gentile client nation category can follow the, exactly the same pattern of Israel. Yet there are some dramatic differences that are related to the unique church age, the unique power of the church age, both in grace provision and in the unique spiritual life. So a client nation is a synonym for a priest nation. And the name priest nation is used for Israel because it had a specialized priesthood. The term client nation is used for any Gentile nation that performs the same functions during the church age. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Roman history, a client nation 
with someone dependent on another family. You see, Rome was its own nation. It had its own client nations, it would call it, because they became so large. So instead of calling a Gentile nation a priest nation as such, the believers in the church age are a set-apart priesthood and a and royal family to God. Of course, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5, and coming to him as to a living stone, rejected by men but elect and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house. You can compare that with Hebrews 3, 6. But as a result of the holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through the agency of Jesus Christ. Now Israel has always been called a holy nation or a set-apart nation. The church is called a holy priesthood. Why? Because in the church age, every believer is a priest, and we went over that. So Jesus Christ tested and proved the prototype spiritual life. And we offer up spiritual sacrifice by the fulfillment of the adult, three adult stages of the unique spiritual life. Now, God does not want sacrifice and offerings anymore. He wants the sacrifice of the spiritual life. He didn't even want sacrifices and offerings in the past except as a learning tool. What was important is that they understood. He wants the sacrifice of the spiritual life. And the spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God are related to the four spiritual mechanics of the spiritual life. And we'll go over those. I'm just hurrying it up so I can close it up. And in 1 Peter 2, 9, But we are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a set-apart nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out from the darkness into His marvelous light. And so I taught to you earlier the importance of 1 Peter 2, 5 and 2, 9 and the, effect, and the fact that each and every one of us are priests. And as priest, that means privacy and freedom. No matter what situation you live in, whether you live in a client nation and a believer, you still have spiritual freedom. Or if you live in communist China or communist Cuba and you're a believer, you still have the priesthood. And you still have that privacy of the priesthood no matter how, how much the government gets after you to try to peek into your soul and see what you're thinking. They can't do it. So that should be of great solace to you because hard times are ahead unless there's a change in this country. And what I mean is people need to change their mind about Christ and they need to change their mind about Bible doctrine. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit challenge us by what we've noted and now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.